The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Hello and welcome to 601. I'm Danny Freeman. I'm the lecturer. One thing you should know about today is that there's a single handout. You should have picked it up on your way in. It's available at either of the two doors. What I want to do today in this first lecture is mostly focus on content. But before I do that, since 601 is a little bit of an unusual course, I want to give you a little bit of an overview and tell you a little bit about the administration of the course. 601 is mostly about modes of reasoning. What we would like you to get out of this course is ways to think about engineering. We want to talk about how do you design, how do you build, how do you construct, how do you debug complicated systems. That's what engineers do. And we're very good at it. And that, we want to make you very good at it. We're very good at it, and you know that from your common everyday experience. Laptops are incredible. As we go through the course, you're going to see that laptops incorporate things from the tiniest, tiniest level. Things so small that you can't see them. They're microscopic. The individual transistors are not things that you can see. We develop special tools for you even to be able to visualize them. And yet we conglomerate billions of them into a system that works relatively reliable. Now I realize I'm going out on a limb because you, when you say things like that, then things always fail. But I'll go out on a limb and say, for the most part, the systems that we construct are very reliable. <clears throat> We'd like you to know how you think about making such a complicated system and making it reliable. We want to tell you about how you would model things. How do you gain insight? How do you get predictability? How do you figure out how something will work before you've built it? <clears throat> if you're limited to try out how things work by actually constructing it, you spend a lot of time constructing things that never make it. We want to avoid that by, where we can, making a model, analyzing the model, making a prediction from the model, and using that prediction to build a better system on the first try. We want to tell you about how to augment the physical behavior of a system by putting computation in it. That's a very uh, powerful technique that is increasingly common in anything from a microwave to a refrigerator. <clears throat> we'd like you to know the principles by which you do that. And we'd like you to be able to build systems that are robust to failure. That's a newer idea. It's something that people are very good at. If we try to do something and we make a mistake, we know how to fix it. And often the fix works. We're less good at doing that in constructing artificial systems, in engineering systems. And we'd like to talk about principles by which we can do that. So the goal of 601 is then really to convey a distinct perspective about how we engineer systems. Now, having said that, this is not a philosophy course. We are not going to make lists of things to do if you want it to be robust. We're going to learn to do things by actually making systems. This is an introductory engineering course. And so you're going to build things. The idea is going to be that in constructing those things, we've rigged the exercises so that some of those important themes become transparent. So we, the idea is this is introductory engineering. You'll all make things. You'll all get things to work. And in the process of doing that, learn something about the bigger view of how uh, quality engineering happens. <clears throat> so, the, so despite the fact that we're really about modes of reasoning, that will be grounded in content. We selected the content 
very broadly from across EECS. EECS is an enormous endeavor. We can't possibly introduce everything about EECS in one subject. That's ridiculous. However, we wanted to give you a variety. We wanted to give you a sense of the variety of tasks that you can use, that you can, uh, that you can apply the same techniques to. So we want to introduce modes of reasoning and then show you explicitly how you can use those modes of reasoning in a variety of contexts. So we've chosen four, and we've organized the course around four modules. First module is software engineering, then signals and systems, then circuits, then probability and planning. Even so, even having chosen just four out of the vast number of things we could have chosen, there's no way we can tell you adequately, we can't give you an adequate introduction to any of those things either. What we've chosen to do instead is focus on key concepts represented by the asterisks. The idea is going to be we choose one or two things and really focus on those deeply so you get a thorough understanding, not only of how that fits within, for example, the context of software engineering, but also how that concept ramifies into other areas. Notice that I, I tried to choose the stars so they hit multiple circles. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to not only introduce an idea to you, but also show you how it connects to other ideas. Um, so the idea then is to focus on a few, we hope, very well chosen applications that will demonstrate uh, a variety of powerful techniques. <clears throat> Our mantra, the way we intend to go about teaching this stuff, is practice theory, practice. There's an enormous educational literature that says, whether you like it or not, people learn better when they're doing things. You have a lot of experience with that. You have a lot of experience on the other side, too. I'll try to forget the other side, or at least try to wipe it from your, your brain uh, momentarily, to focus on your more fundamental modes of learning. When you were a kid and you were learning your first language, you didn't learn all the rules of grammar first. You didn't learn all the letters of the alphabet first. You didn't learn about conjugating verbs first. You learned a little bit about language. You started to use it. You ran into problems. You learned a little more about language. You learned to, con you know, to, to go from words like feed me to higher level concepts like, hey, what's for dinner? Uh, so the idea is that you learned it in an iterative process where you learned some stuff, tried it out, learned some more stuff, tried it out, and it built up. There's an enormous literature in education that says that's exactly how we always learn everything. And so that's the way this course is focused. What we will do is, for example, for today, we'll learn a little bit about software engineering. Then we'll do two lab sessions where you actually try to use the things that we talk about. Then we'll come back to lecture and we'll have some more theory about how you would uh, do programming. And then you go back to the lab and do some more stuff. And the hope is that by, by this tangible context, you'll have a deeper appreciation of the ideas that we're trying to convey. So let me tell you a little bit about the four modules that we've chosen. The course is going to be organized on four modules. Each module will take about one-fourth of the course. First thing we'll look at is software engineering. As I said, we don't have time to focus on or even survey the big idea, all of the big ideas in software engineering. It's far too big. So we're going to focus narrowly on one or two things. We'd like you to know about abstraction and modularity because that's such an important idea in the construction of big systems. So that's going to be our focus. We'll begin, in today's lecture, we'll begin talking about uh, modularity and abstraction at the small scale. How does it affect the things you type as instructions to a computer? But by next week, we're going to be talking about a whole bigger scale. By next week, we're going to talk about constructing software modules at a much higher level. In particular, we'll talk about something that we'll call a state machine. 
A state machine is a thing that works in steps. On every step, the state machine gets a new input. Then based on that input and its memory of what's come before, the state machine decides to do something. It generates an output. And then the process repeats. We will see that that kind of an abstraction, state machines, has a, there's a way to think about state machines that is compositional, that you can uh, think of as a hierarchy, just as you can think of low-level hierarchies within a language. I'll say a lot more about that today. <clears throat> so the idea will be that once you've composed a state machine, you'll be able to join two state machines and have its behavior look just like one state machine. That's a way to get a more complicated behavior by constructing two simpler behaviors. That's what we want. We want to learn tools that lets us compose complex behaviors out of simple behaviors. And the tangible model of that will be the robot. We will see how to write a program that controls a robot as a state machine. That's certainly not the only way you could control a robot. And it's probably not the way you would first think of it if you took one course in programming and somebody said to you, go program the robot to do something. What we will see is that it's a very powerful way to think about it for exactly this reason of modularity. <clears throat> The bigger point that we will make in thinking about this first module is the idea of how do you make systems modular, how do you use abstraction to simplify the design task, and in particular, we will focus on something that we'll call PCAP. When you think about a system, we will always think about it in terms of what are the primitives, how do you combine them, how do you abstract a bigger behavior, from those smaller behaviors, and what are the patterns that are important to, to uh, capture. So the bigger point is this idea of PCAP, which we will then revisit in every subsequent model, uh, module. <clears throat> OK, second module is on signals and systems. That's also an enormous area. So we only have time to do one thing. The thing that we will do is we will think about discrete time feedback. How do you make a system that's cognizant of what it's done so that it, in the future, can do things with awareness of how it got there? A good example is robotic steering. So the idea is going to be, OK, think about what you do when you're driving a car, and think about how you would tell a robot to do that same thing. Here's a naive driving algorithm. I don't recommend it, but it's widely used in Boston, apparently. <laughs> I find myself to the right of where I would like to be. So what should I do? Turn left. I'm still to the right of where I'd like to be. What should I do? Turn left. Oh, I'm exactly where I should be. What should I do? Go straight ahead. <laughs> oh, that's a bad idea. And what we'll see is that perfectly innocent-looking algorithms can have horrendous performance. What we'll do is try to make an abstraction of that. We'll try to make a model. We'll try to capture that in math so that we don't need to build it to see the bad behavior. We'll make a model. We'll use the model to, to predict that that algorithm stinks. But more importantly, we'll use the model to figure out an algorithm that will work better. In fact, we'll even be able to come up with bounds on how well such a controller could possibly work. So the focus in this module is going to be, how do you make a model to predict behavior? How do you analyze the model so that you can design a better system? And then how do you use the model and the analysis to, um, to, to make a, a um, well-behaved system. The third module is on circuits. Again, circuits is huge. We don't have time to talk about all of circuits. We'll do very simple things. We'll focus our attention on how you would add a sensory capability to an already complicated system. 
the idea is going to be to start with a robot. I guess this is brighter. Start with our robots and design a head for the robot. The robot comes from the factory with sonar sensors. The sonar sensors are these things. There's eight of them. They tell you how far away something that reflects the ultrasonic wave is. As they come from the factory, the robots can't sense light. What you'll do is add light sensors. The goal is to make a system to modify the robot so that the robot tracks light. So it's a very simple goal. And the way we'll do that is to augment the robot with a simple sensor here, showed a little more magnified here. The idea is that this is a Lego motor. The Lego motor will, let, will turn this relative to the attachment. That's the robot head's neck. So you, the ro robot will be able to do this. And the robot will have eyes. These are photosensors, photoresistors, actually. So the idea is going to be that there's information available in those sensors for figuring out where light is so that you could track it. Your job will be to build a circuit, that's this thing, that connects via cables, these red cables and yellow cables, connects via cables over to this head. We'll give you the head. Your job will be to make the circuit that converts the signal from the photoresistor, which is in proportion to light, and figures out how to turn the motor to get the head to face the light, and then ship that information down to the robot to let the robot turn its wheels to get the body. So it's kind of like the light comes on bright over here, and the robot looks at it and says, oh yeah, that's where I want to be. So that's the idea in the third module, is to incorporate new sensing capabilities into the robot. The final module is on probability and planning. And the idea there is to learn about how you make um, systems that are robust to uncertainty and that can, uh, make, can implement complicated plans that they, too, are robust to uncertainty. So there's a number of things that we will do, including uh, creating maps of spaces that the robot doesn't understand, telling the, uh, figuring out, telling the robot how to localize itself, how, how if it woke up suddenly in an environment, it could figure out where it is, uh, how to make a plan. And as an example, I'll show you the kind of system that we will construct. Here the idea is that we have a robot. The robot knows where it is. Imagine there's a GPS in it. There isn't, but imagine there is. So the robot knows where it is, and it knows where it wants to go. That's the star. But it has no idea what kind of obstacles are in the way. So you know, if you were a robotic driver in Boston, you know that you started out at home and you want to end up at MIT. But there's these annoying obstacles. You know, they're called people that you should, in principle, at least, uh, you know, miss. <laughs> okay, so that's that's kind of the idea. So, the, so I know where I am. I'm the robot. I know where I am. I know where I, where I want to be. And I'm going to summarize that information here. Where I am is purple. Where I want to be is gold. And uh, I have a plan that's blue. My plan's very simple. I don't know anything about anything other than I'm in, I'm in Waltham and I want to go to Cambridge. So, you know, blast east. So I imagine that the best way to do there is a straight line. <clears throat> OK, so now what I'm going to do is uh, turn on the robot. The, the robot has now made one step. And I told you before about these um, sonar sensors. From the sonar sensors, the robot has learned now that there seems to be something reflecting at each of these black dots. It got a reflection from the black dots from the, from the sonar sensors. That means there's probably a wall there or a person or something that, in principle, I should avoid. <clears throat> so, uh, and the red dots represent, OK, the obstacle is so close, I really can't get there. So I'm excluded from the red spots because I'm too big. The black, the black spots seem to be an ob obstacle. The red spots seem to be where I can't fit. 
I'd still want to go from, from where I am, purple, to where I want to be, gold. So what I do is I compute a new plan. OK, then I start to take a step along that plan. And as I'm stepping along, OK, so now I think that I can't go from where I started to over to here. I have to go around this wall that I didn't know about initially. So now I just start driving. And it looks fine, right? I'm getting there. Right? So now I know I can go straight down here. Oh, wait a minute. There's another wall. OK, what do I do now? So as the robot goes around along, it didn't know when it started what kinds of obstacles it would encounter. But as it's driving, it learned, oh, that didn't work. Start over. <laughs> so the idea is that this robot is executing a very complicated plan. The plan has, in fact, many subplans. And the subplans all involve uncertainty. It didn't know where the walls were when it started. And when it's all done, it's going to have figured out where the walls were and, provided there's a way, presumably find the way to negotiate the maze and get to the, to the uh, destination. So the idea, then, is that the, if, you were to ask, if you were asked to write a conventional kind of program for solving that, it might be kind of hard because of the number of contingencies involved. What we will do is break down the problem and figure out simple and elegant ways to deal not only with uncertainty, but how do you make complex plans. So as I said, our primary pedagogy is going to be practice, theory, practice. And so that ramifies in how the course is organized. So this is a quick map of some of the aspects of the course. So we'll have weekly lectures. It's lecture unintensive. In total, there's only 13 lectures. We'll meet once a week here for lecture. There's readings. There's voluminous readings. There's readings about every topic that we will talk, talk about. And the readings were specifically designed for this course. I highly recommend that you become familiar with the readings. If you have a question after lecture, it's probably there. It's probably explained. We will do online tutor problems. Uh, we sent you an email if you pre-registered for the course, so you may already know about this. The idea is going to be that there's um, ways that you can prepare for the course by doing computer exercises. And we will also use those same kinds of exercises in all of the class sessions. We will have two kinds of lab experiences. Besides lecture, the other two events that, have, that you have to attend are a software lab and a design lab. That's the practice part. So after you learn a little bit about the theory by going to lecture, by, by doing the reading, then you go to the lab and try some things out. We call the first lab a software lab. It's a short lab. It's an hour and a half. You work individually. You try things out. You write little programs. The, the uh, courseware can check the program to see if it's OK. Um, and uh, primarily, the exercises in the software lab are due during the software lab. But on occasion, there will be extra things due a day or two later. The due dates are very clearly written in the tutor exercises. <clears throat> Once a week, there's a design lab. That's a three-hour session in which you work with a partner. The reason for the partner is that the intent, the difference between the design labs and the software labs is that the design labs ask you to solve slightly more open-ended questions, the kind of question that you might have no clue what we're asking, open-ended, the kind of thing that you will be asked to do after you graduate. Design the system. What do you mean design the system? <laughs> um, so the idea is that working with a partner will give you a, a second immediate source of help and a little more confidence if neither of you knows the solution so that you raise your hand and say, I don't have a clue what's going on here. So the idea is that once a week we do a software lab individually. Once a week we do a design lab, a little more open-ended with partners. There's a little bit of written homework. Four total, it's not much compared to other subjects. It's mostly practice. Uh, there's a nano quiz. 
just to help you keep pace, to make sure that you don't uh, get too far behind, the first 15 minutes of every design lab starts with a nano quiz. The nano quiz are, are intended to be simple if you've caught up, if you're up to date. So the idea is that you go to design lab, the first thing you do is a little 15 minute nano quiz. The nano quiz uses a tutor, much like the homework tutor, much like the Python tutor. Um, and it's intended to be simple. Uh, but it does mean, please get to the design lab on time. The nano quizzes are administered by the software. It starts when the hour, when the design lab starts, it times out 15 minutes later. So if you come 10 minutes late, you'll have five minutes to do something that we plan to give you 15 minutes for. Uh, we will also have exams and interviews. The interviews are intended to be um, a one-on-one -on -one conversation about how the labs went. Uh, and we will have two midterms and a final. So that's kind of the logistics. The idea behind the logistics is practice, theory, practice. Come to the labs, try things out, make sure you understand, develop a little code, type it in, see if it works. If it works, you're on top of things. You're ready to get the ne next batch of information from the lecture and readings. <clears throat> OK, let's go on and let's talk about the technical material in the first module of the course, in the software module. We kick the course off talking about software engineering for two reasons. We'd like you to know about software engineering. It's an incredibly important part of our department. It's an incredibly important part of the engineering of absolutely any system, any modern system. But we'd also like you to know about it because it provides a very convenient way to think about it. It's a convenient language to think about the design issues, the engineering issues, in all the other parts of the class. So it's a very good place to start. So to, what, what I will do today is talk about some of the very simplest ideas about abstraction and modularity in what I think of as the lowest level of granularity. How do you think about abstraction and modularity at the micro scale, at the individual lines of code scale? As I said earlier, we will, as we progress, look at modularity and abstraction at the higher scale. But we have to start somewhere, and we're going to start by thinking about how do you think about uh, abstraction and modularity at the micro scale. <clears throat> Special note about programming. So what we are trying to do is, in the first two weeks, ramp everybody up to some level of software security where you feel comfortable so the first two weeks of this course is intended to make you comfortable with programming. We don't assume you've done extensive programming before. We want you to become comfortable that you're not behind. And that's the focus of the first two weeks exam uh, exercises. <clears throat> if you have little or no previous background, if you are uncomfortable, please do the Python tutor exercises. If you have not, if you uh, do not have a lot of experience programming, if you're uncomfortable with, with the expectation that you can do programming, do that first. That takes priority over all the other assignments during the first two weeks. In particular, if you're uncomfortable, we will run a special Python help session on Sunday. And if you attend that, you can get a free extension. The idea is completing the tutor exercises is intended to make you feel comfortable that you have the software background to finish the rest of the course. Do that first. We will forgive falling behind in other things so that you feel comfortable with programming. If, at the end of two weeks, you still feel uncomfortable, we have a deal with 600, the Python programming class, that they will allow you to switch your registration from 601 to 600. But that expires 
Valentine's Day. So you have to make up your mind before Valentine's Day if you'd like to use that option. So the idea is we'd like you to be comfortable with programming. If you haven't programmed before, do the Python tutor exercises. Go to Software Lab. Go to Design Lab, but work on the tutor exercises. The staff will help you with them. You can go to Office Hours. There's Office Hours listed in, on the home page. You should try to become comfortable, and you should try to set as your goal, I'm going to be comfortable before Valentine's Day. And if you're not, talk to a staff, a staff member about that. OK, so what do I want you to know about programming? Well, we're going to use Python. We selected Python because it's very simple and because it lets us illustrate some very important ideas in software engineering in a very simple context. That's the reason. One of the reasons that it's simple is that it's an interpreter. After some initialization, the behavior of Python is to fall into an interpreter loop. The interpreter loop is ask the user what he would like me to do, read what the user types, figure out what they're talking about, and print the result, repeat. Very simple. What that means is that you can learn by doing. That's one of the points of today's software lab. You can simply walk up to a computer, type the word Python. What you type is in red. Type the word Python. It will prompt you, so this Chevron, that says, I'd like you to tell me something to do. I have nothing to do. <laughs> if you type 2, Python tries to interpret that. In this particular case, Python says, oh, I see. That's a primitive data item. That's an integer. This person wants me to understand an integer. And so it will echo 2, indicating that it thinks you've, you want it to understand a simple integer. Similarly, if you type 5.7, it says, oh, I got that. That's a float. The person wants me to remember a floating point number. And it will similarly echo the float. Now, of course, the floats don't have a, um, so there's no exact representation for floats, right? There's too many of them, right? There's a lot of them. <laughs> there's even more floats than there are ints, right? <laughs> so it has an approximation. So it will print its approximation to the float that, you, that it thinks you are interested in. If you type a string, hello, it'll say, oh, Primitive data structure, string. And it'll print out that string. So the idea is, one of the features of Python that makes it easy to learn is the fact that it's interpreter-based. You can play around. You can learn by doing. Now, of course, if the only thing it did was simple data structures, it would not be very useful. So the next more, element, uh, the next more complex thing that it can do is think about combinations. <clears throat> If you type 2 plus 3, it says, oh, I got it. This person's interested in a combination. I should combine by the plus operator two ints, 2 and 3. Oh, and if I do that, if I combine by the plus operator 2 and 3, I'll get 5. So it prints 5. So that's a way you know that it interprets 2 plus 3 as 5. <clears throat> Similarly here, except I've mixed types. 5.7 plus 3, it says, oh, this user wants me to apply the plus operator <clears throat> on a float and an int. OK, well, I'll upgrade the int to a float. I'll do the, the float version, and I'll get this, which is its representation of 8.7. <clears throat> so the idea is that it will first try to interpret what you're saying as a simple data type. If that works, it prints the result to tell you what it thinks is going on. It then will try to interpret it as an expression. And sometimes the expressions won't make sense. In particular, if you try to add an int to a string, it's going to say, huh? 
And over the course of the first two weeks, we hope that you get familiar with interpreting this kind of mess. That's Python's attempt to tell you what it was trying to do on your behalf and can't figure out what you're talking about. <clears throat> OK, so that was simple. But it already illustrates something that's very important. And that's the idea of a composition. So the way Python works, the fact that when you added 3 to 2, it came out 5, what we were doing was composing complicated, well, potentially complicated, that was pretty simple, <clears throat> potentially complicated expressions and reducing them to a single data structure. And so that means that, in some sense, this operation 3 times 8 can be thought of as exactly the same as if the user had typed in 24. Whenever you can substitute for a complex expression a simpler thing, we say that the, that the system is compositional. That's a very powerful idea. Even though it's simple, it's a very powerful idea. And it's an idea that you all know. <clears throat> You've seen it before in algebra, in arithmetic. So in, in arithmetic expressions, you can think about how the sum of two integers is an int. That's a closure. That's a kind of a combination that makes the system compositional. And that provides a layer of uh, hierarchical thinking so that in your head, even though it says 3 times 8, you don't need to remember that anymore. You can say, oh, for, for any purposes that follow, I might just as well think of 3 times 8 as being a single integer, 24. <clears throat> it's part of many other kinds of systems. For example, natural language. The simplest example in natural language is that you can think about apples are good as snacks. Apples is a noun. <clears throat> it's a plural noun. Or you could substitute apples and oranges, and it makes complete sense within that same structure. So apples and oranges are good as snacks. The, the combination of apples and oranges works um, in every way from the point of view of the grammar in the same way that a, a simple noun, apples, worked. <clears throat> What we would like to do is use that idea as the starting point for a more general compositional system. <clears throat> and a good way to think about that is by way of names. What if we had some sequence of operations that we think is particularly important so that we would like to somehow canonize that so that subsequently we can use that sequence of operations easily? Python provides a very simple way to do it. Every programming language does. It's not unique to Python. <clears throat> but the idea is, so here's an example. 2 times 2, I'm squaring 2 and get 4. 3 times 3, I'm squaring 3 and I'm getting 9. 8 plus 4 times 8 plus 4, I'm squaring 8 plus 4. 8 plus 4, well, I can think of that as 12. I'm squaring 12, I'm getting 144. <clears throat> The thing I'm trying to illustrate there is the notion of squaring. Squaring is a sequence of operations that I would like to be able to canonize as a single entity so that in subsequent programs, I can think of the squaring operation as a single operation, <clears throat> just like I think of times. The way we say that in Python is define square of x to be return x squared. Then, having made that definition, I can say square of 6, and the answer is 36. OK, this is a very small step, but it illustrates a very important point, the idea being that Python provides a compositional uh, uh, facility. And it's hierarchical. Having defined square, I can use square just as though it were a primitive operator. And I can use square to define higher level operations. 
So for example, what if I were interested in doing lots of sums of squares? <clears throat> Say I'm Pythagoras, right? So I might want to add the square of 2 and the square of 4 to get 20, or the square of 3 with the square of 4 to get 25. Using that simple idea of composition, we can write a new program, sum of squares. <clears throat> sum of squares takes two arguments, x and y, and it returns the square of x and the square of y. Sum of squares doesn't care about how you compute the square. It trusts that square knows how to do that. So the work is smaller. The idea is that square takes care of squaring single numbers. <clears throat> Sum of squares doesn't have to know how to square numbers. It just needs to know how to add, make a sum of squares. <clears throat> so what we've done is we've broken a task, which was not very complicated, but the whole idea um, uh, is hierarchical. We've taken a, a problem and broken it into two pieces. We factored the problem into how do you do a square and how do you sum squares. <clears throat> and the idea then is that this hierarchical structure is a way of building complex systems out of simpler parts. <clears throat> so that's the idea of how you would build programs that are compositional. Python also provides a utility for making lists, uh, for making data structures that are compositional. The most primitive is uh, a list. So in Python, you can specify a list. Here's a list of integers. <clears throat> so the list says beginning list, end of list, elements of list. So there's five elements in the list. The integers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Python doesn't care what the elements of a list are. We'll see in a minute that that's really important. <clears throat> but for the time being, the simplest thing that you can imagine is a heterogeneous list. It's not critical that the list contain just integers. Here's a list that contains an int, a string, an int, and a string. Python doesn't care. It's a list that has four elements. The first element's an int, the second element's a string, etc. Here's an even more complex example. Here's a list of lists. How many elements are in that list? Three. How many elements are in that list? So the idea is that you can build more complex data structures out of simple ones. That's the idea of compositional factoring applied to data. Just like it was important when we were thinking about procedures to associate names with procedures, that's what DEF did, we can also think about associating names with data structures. And that's what we use something that Python calls a variable for. So I can say b is 3. And that associates the data item 3 with the label b. I can say x is 5 times 2.2. <clears throat> Python will figure out what I mean by the expression on the right. It'll figure out that I'm composing by using the star operator, which is multiply, an integer and a float, which will give me a float. The answer to that is going to be a floating point number. And it will assign a label x to that floating point number. You can have a more complicated uh, list, a data structure, and associate the name y with it. Then having associated the name y, you get many of the same benefits of associating a name with a data structure that we got previously in associating a name with an operation. So we can say y of 0, and what that means is, What's the zeroth element of the data structure y? So the zeroth element of the data structure y is a list, one, two, three. 
Python has some funky notations. The minus one element is the last one. So the minus one element of y is 7, 8, 9. And it's completely hierarchical. If I ask for the minus one element of y, I get 7, 8, 9. But then if I ask for the first element of that result, I get 8. OK? Everything's, everything's clear? OK. Just to make sure everything's clear, I want to ask you a question. <clears throat> but to kick off the idea of working together, I'd like you to think about this question with your neighbor. So before thinking about this question, everybody stand up. Introduce yourself to your neighbor. So now, so now I'd like, to, I'd like you to each discuss with your neighbor the list that is best represented by which of the following figures, one, two, three, four, or five, none of the above. And in 30 seconds, I'm going to ask everybody to raise a hand with a number of fingers indicating the right answer. You're allowed to talk. <laughs> That's the whole point of having a partner. <clears throat> OK. I'd like everybody now to raise their hand, put up the number of fingers that show the answer, and I want to uh, tally. <laughs> Fantastic. Everybody gets it. OK. So, what's, so which one do you like? Three. three. Why do you like three? Somebody explain this to me. <laughs> it just looks good. It's pattern recognition. What's good about three? Compositional. What is the compositional element in the pictures? What represents what? OK, A represents A. That's pretty easy, right? <laughs> so that takes care of the bulk of the figures. What's the blue lines represent? Uh, someone else? I didn't quite understand. The angles represent like a list. 
They, they represent a list. Where, where is the list on the figures? The vertex. The vertices are lists. So in three, at the highest level, we have a list that's composed of how many elements? Two. The first element of that list is? And the second element of that list is? Another list. That's the hierarchical part, right? That second list has how many elements? Fine. So reverse. You got it. What is the list represented by number two? A single list with five elements. Square bracket A, comma B, comma C, comma D, comma E. Square bracket. Right? What is the list represented by that one? Ah. <laughs> it's not a list. <laughs> right? What is it? Who knows? So we could make that a variable. If we said A is a variable that comprises B and C, then we have the problem of how we're going to associate variables and elements into this list, right? So the weird thing about this one and let's see, that one's weird. This one's also kind of weird. This one's weird because we're giving names to lists in a fashion that's not showed up here, right? That's not to say you couldn't invent a meaning. It's just that it doesn't map very well to that representation. <clears throat> Similarly, over here, we seem to be giving the, the name B to the element A, and then the name C to the element B. What on earth? It's not clear what we're doing there either. <clears throat> OK, so the point is to get you thinking about the abstract representation of lists and how that maps into a complex data structure. That was the whole point. <clears throat> OK, so we've talked about then four things so far. How do you think about operations in a hierarchical fashion? And the idea was composition. We think about composing simple operations to make bigger compound operations. That's a way of saying there's this set of operations that I want to call foo. So every time I do this complicated thing that has three pages of code, that's one foo. And that's a way that we can then combine foos in some other horribly complicated way to make big foos. Right? So the idea is composition. That's the first idea. The second is, the, is associating a name with that composition. That's what def does, define name, name of a subroutine. So we thought about composing operations, associating names with them. We composed data in terms of lists, and we associated names with those lists in terms of variables. The next thing we want to think about is a higher order construct where we would like to conglomerate into one data structure both data and procedures. Python has a concept called a class that lets us do that. <clears throat> In Python, you make a new class by saying to the Python prompt, I want a new class called student. And then under student, there is this thing, which we will call an attribute. An attribute of, to a class is simply a data item associated with the class. <clears throat> and a method, a method is just a procedure that is associated with a class. So there's this the single item class called student that has one piece of data, its attribute school, and one uh, procedure, which is the method calculate final rate. So then this is the kind of data structure you might imagine that a registrar would have. <clears throat> it's a way to associate. So the idea here is that everybody here is a student. They all have a school, and they all have a way of calculating their final grade. That's a very narrow view that maybe a registrar would have. <clears throat> so classes, having defined them, we can then uh, use the class to define an instance. So an instance 
is a data structure that uh, inherits all of the structure from the class, but also provides a mechanism for having specific data associated with the instance. So in Python, I say Mary is a student. By mentioning the name of the class and putting parentheses on it, I say give me an instance of the student. So now Mary is a name associated with an instance of the class student. John is similarly an instance of the class student. So both Mary and John have schools. In fact, they're both the same. The school of Mary and the school of John are both MIT. Uh, but I can, use, I can extend the instance of Mary to include a new attribute, the section number, <clears throat> so that Mary's section number is three and John's section number is four. So this provides a way, it's a higher order concept, right? We thought of a way to aggregate operations into complicated operations, data into complicated data. Classes aggregate data and operations. <clears throat> Classes allow us to create a structure and then generate instances, and then the instances have access to those uh, features that were defined in the class, but also have the ability to define their own unique attributes and methods. <clears throat> You can also use a class to define a subclass. So here I'm defining the subclass student 601. All student 601s are members of the class student. The reverse is not true. So all, students in, uh, all student 601 entities inherit everything that a student has, but all 601 students share some other things. Besides having a school, which all students have, 601 students also have a lecture day, a lecture time, and a method for calculating tutor scores. Not all students have a way, have a method for calculating tutor scores, but six, members of the class student 601 do. So this, again, represents a way of organizing data and operations <clears throat> in a way that makes it easier to compose higher, uh, bigger, more complex structures. <clears throat> the final thing that I want to talk about today is the specific gory details for how Python manages the association between names and entities. We've already seen two of those. Naming operations is via def and it gives rise to the name of a procedure. Variables are ways of naming data structures. Now we've seen a way of naming uh, classes. And in fact, it's helpful if you understand. So Python associates names and entities in a very simple, straightforward fashion. And if you know the ground rules, it makes it very easy to deal with. And if you don't know the ground rules, it makes it very hard to deal with. <clears throat> so what's the ground rules? Here's the gory details. So Python associates names with value, values in what Python calls a binding environment. An environment is just a list that associates a name and an entity. So if you were to type b equals 3, what Python is actually doing is it's building this environment. When you type b equals 3, it adds to the environment an, a name b and associates that name with the integer 3. When you type x equals 2.2, it adds a name x and associates it with the float 2.2. When you say foo is minus 506 times 2, it makes the name foo and associates it with an int minus 1012. <clears throat> then, if you ask Python about b, the rule is look it up in the environment and type the thing that b refers to. So when you type b, what Python really does is it goes to the environment. It says, do I have some entity called b? Well, yes, I do. It happens to be an int 3, so it prints 3. 
if you ask, what is A, Python says, OK, in my environment, do I have some uh, name A? It doesn't find it, so it prints out this cryptic message <clears throat> that basically says, sorry, guys, I can't find something called A in the current environment. That's the key to the way Python does all name bindings. So in general, there's a global environment. You start typing to Python. It just starts adding and modifying the bindings in the binding environment. <clears throat> so if you type A equals 3 and then type A, it'll find 3. If you then type B equals A plus 2, it evaluates the right-hand side relative to the current environment. So it first looks here, and it says, do I have something called A? Ah, yes. I, it's an integer 3. Substitute that. Do I know what 2 is? Oh, yeah, that's just an int. Do I know what plus is? Oh, yeah, that's the thing that combines two ints. So it decides that A plus 2, it evaluates A plus 2 in the current environment. It gets 5. And it says, oh, I'm trying to do a new equals, a new association, a new variable. Make the name B point to this evaluated in the current environment. So B gets associated with the int 5. Then if I do this line, it, it uh, evaluates B plus 1 in the current environment. <clears throat> B is 5 in the current environment. It adds 1. It gets 6. And then it says, associate this thing, 6, with B. So it overwrites the B, which had been bound to 5, and its B is now bound to 6. OK? So the whole thing, the way it treats variables, the way, it associates a, the way Python associates a name with a value in a variable is evaluate the right-hand side according to the current environment, then change the current environment to reflect the, the new binding. What it does in the case of subroutines is very similar. When you say, so here's an illustration of the, the, the local environment that is generated by this piece of code. When I say A equals 2, it generates a name in the local environment, A. It evaluates the right-hand side and finds 2. So it makes a binding in the local environment where the name A is associated with the integer 2. Then I say define square of x to be return x squared. <clears throat> That's more complicated. Python says, oh. I'm defining a new operation. It's a procedure. The procedure has a formal argument, x. It has a body, return x times x. I'm going to have to remember all of that stuff. So I'm trying to define a new procedure called square. It's going to make a binding for square. So in the future, if somebody says the word square, it'll find out, oh, square, I remember that one. Square, it's a procedure. Just like the binding for a variable might be an int, the binding for a procedure is the name of the procedure. Then in the procedure, which is some other data structure outside the environment, it's got to remember the formal parameters, in this case, x, and the body. And for the purpose of resolving what do the variables mean, it needs to remember what was the binding environment in which this subroutine was defined. <clears throat> so that's, the, that's this arrow. So this, this sequence says, make a new binding square, points to a procedure. The procedure has the formal argument x. It has the body return x times x. And it has the binding. It, has, it came from the environment E1, the current environment. <clears throat> OK, is everybody clear? So the idea is that the environment associates names with things. The thing could be a data item, or it could be a procedure. 
then when you call a procedure, it makes a new environment. <laughs> so what happens then when I try to evaluate a form square of a plus 2? What Python does is it says, OK, I need to figure out what square is. So it looks it up in the environment, and it finds out that square is a procedure. Fine. I know how to deal with procedures. So then it figures out this procedure has a formal argument x. Oh, OK. If I'm going to run this procedure, I'm going to have to know what x means. So Python makes a new environment. Here it's labeled E2, separate from the, the global environment, E1. It makes a new environment that will associate x with something. Doesn't know what it is yet. It just knows that the square is a procedure that takes a formal argument x. So Python makes a new environment E2 with x pointing to something. Then Python evaluates the argument a plus 2 in the environment E1. You called square of a plus 2 in the environment E1. So it figures out what did you mean by a plus, a plus 3. Well, you were in the environment E1. So it means whatever a plus 3 would have meant if he had just typed a plus 3 in that environment. So you evaluate a plus 3 in the environment E1, and you get 5. So then this new environment E2 that is set up for this procedure, square, associates 5 with x. Now it's ready to run the body. So now it runs this procedure, return x times x. <clears throat> But now when it's trying to resolve its variables, it looks it up in E2. So it says, I want to do the procedure, the body, x times x. I need to know what x is, and I need to know it twice. Look up what x means. But I will look it up in my E2 environment that was built specifically for this procedure. And fortunately, there's an x there. So it finds out that x is 5. It multiplies 5 times 5. It gets the answer is 25. It returns 25. And then it destroys this environment E2 because it was only necessary for the time when it was running the procedure body. <clears throat> is that clear? OK, so a, a slightly more difficult example illustrates what happens whenever everything is not defined in the current local environment, <clears throat> what if I type define biz of A? Well, I create a new name in the, in the local environment that points to a procedure. The procedure has a formal parameter A and a body that returns A plus B. The procedure also has was defined within the environment E1, which I'll, I'll keep track of. <clears throat> then if I say B equals 6, that makes a new binding in the global environment, B equals 6. Then if I try to run biz of 2, look up biz. Oh, that's a procedure. Formal parameter A. Make an environment. Has an A in it. What should I put in A? Evaluate the argument 2. OK, A is 2. Put 2 here. Now I'm ready to run the body. Run the body in the environment E2. When I run return A plus B in E2, I have to first figure out A. Well, that's easy. A is 2. Then I have to figure out B. What's B? Six. How do you get six? So this local environment that was created for the formal parameter has as its parent E1, because that's where the procedure was defined. So it doesn't find B in, the, in this local environment. So it goes to the parent. Do you have a B? And it could, in principle, propagate up a chain of environments. So you could construct this hierarchically. So it, it will resolve bindings in the most recent environment that has that binding. <clears throat> so the answer then is that 
when you run biz of two, this b gets associated with that b. OK? So that's how, it, how the uh, environments work for simple procedures and simple data structures. It's very similar for the way it works with classes. So imagine that I had this data, and I wanted to represent that in Python. What I might do is look at the common features. The courses are all the same. The rooms are all the same. The buildings are all the same. The ages are highly variable. Um, so I might want to create a class that has the common data. So I might do this, class staff 601. The course is 601. The building's 34. The room is this. The way Python implements a class is as an environment. Executing this set of statements builds the class environment. This is it. It's a list of bindings. Here I'm binding the name course to the string 601, et cetera. If there were a method, I would do the same thing, except it would look like a procedure then. <clears throat> so this creates the staff 601 environment. Staff 601, because I executed the class and statement, this class statement, that creates a binding in the local environment, staff 601, which points to the new environment. So now in the future, when Python encounters the name staff 601, it will discover that that's an, that's a, um, that's an environment. Python implements classes as environments. So now, <clears throat> when I want to access elements within a class, I use a special notation. It's a dot notation. Python regards dots as ways of navigating an environment. When Python parses staff point room, it looks up staff 601 in the current environment. If it finds an environment, it then says, oh, I know about this dot room thing. All I do is I look up the room name in the environment staff 601. And when it does that, it gets the answer 501. And uh, the same sort of ha thing happens here. It looks up staff 601. It finds an environment. It looks up coolness. It finds out there is no such thing. Well, no, that's not true. <laughs> so it creates coolness within 601. And assigns a variable, and, and assigns an integer 11 to it. <clears throat> so then the way classes, the way Python treats methods is completely analogous. So, uh, oh, no, excuse me, instances. So I'm doing instances first. If I make pat be an instance of staff 601, mm -hmm. pat is an instance of the class staff 601, pat is implemented as an environment. So when I make pat, pat points to a new environment, here E3. The parent of E3 is the class that pat belongs to, which is here E2. And when I make the instance, it's empty. But now if I uh, ask what is pat.course, well, pat points to this environment. Does this environment have something called a course? No. Does the parent? Yes. Course is bound to the string 601, so pat.course is 601. Just the same as staff 601.course had been 601. Pat's a new instant. Pat is an instance. It's a new environment with the class environment as its parent. Uh, you can add instances, you can add attributes to instances, and all that does is populate the environment associated with the instance. You can add methods to classes, and that does the same thing. So here I've got the class staff 601, which has a method salutation, and instance variables, course, building, and room. <clears throat> so when I build that structure, staff 601 points to 
an environment that contains salutation, which is a procedure in addition to a bunch of instance variables. So now all the rules that we've talked about with regard to environments apply now to this class. So in particular, I can say staff 601 salutation of Pat. When Python parses staff 601, it finds an environment. It says dot salutation. Oh, I know how to do that. Within the, when, within the environment staff 601, look for a uh, binding for the name salutation. Do I find one? Well, yeah, there it is. It points to a procedure. So staff.salutation is a procedure. Do just the same things that we would have done with a simple procedure. The only difference here is that the procedure came from a class. In this particular case, the, uh, the subroutine that I define has a formal parameter self. So then that build, that's going to have to build when I try to evaluate it, that has to build a local, that has to build a binding for self, which is set to pat. Pat was an environment, so self gets pointed to pat. So now when I run staff.601 salutation on pat, it behaves as though that generic method was applied to the instance pat. We'll do that a lot. It's a little bit of uh, redundancy. We know that Pat is a member of Staff 601. So we will define a special form, or I should say Python defines a special form that makes that easy to say. This is the way we will usually say the instance Pat should run the class method salutation on itself. This is simply a simplified notation that means precisely that. OK, so what we covered today then was supposed to be the most elementary ideas in how you construct modular programs. Modularity at the small scale. How do you make operations that are hierarchical, data structures, and classes? What we will do for the rest of the week is practice those activities. <laughs>